Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to Gaming Renewed. Today we're gonna to talk about random inputs on your DualShock 3 uh, or maybe just six axis controller. Both of them do it. Uh, this one here is actually a DualShock 3. And by random inputs, I pretty much mean once you connect it to the PS3, and we'll do that here. You can kind of shake it and yeah, it just starts kind of going crazy. You can even move the cable up here and get it to move <laughs> a lot of the, but we'll take that off before it probably bricks the PS3 or something. But a lot of the controllers we get in, uh, if they do have an issue for the PS3 ones, it's actually that one. Um, it's a really simple thing to fix, actually. It's actually the, it's like a little small, like, it's basically like a ribbon cable, but it doesn't lock into anything. It just presses up against the board. And what happens is the little phone behind it, just over time, it just gets weaker. So it doesn't put enough pressure against it. So basically it doesn't make a clean connection anymore. And you just get randomized inputs. That's why when you move the cable, it moves this part, which moves the board and kind of hits that cable a little bit and you get your inputs. So yeah, we're going to break this apart, show you how to fix it. Uh, like I said, it's actually a very simple fix. And then we'll show you that it uh, it actually does fix the issue. We do this all the time, and I've never had an issue uh, with using this fix. Um, now, I know I said that the next video, which is this video, would be about using Walmart WFS. And at the end of this video, I will tell you why that video did not happen. <laughs> Long story short, Walmart uh, WFS is a complete headache that I decided not to deal with, and there was really no reason to deal with it, but we'll get into that later. So let's go ahead and crack this one open. All right, so the only things you really need to fix it is I use some uh, thermal pad, which pretty much it's a non-cut thermal pad thing that I get. Uh, I use this basically to replace the thermal pads in the PS3s uh, and the PS3 fat models that I do resell. Um, but it actually works perfect for this as well. Um, you can really use almost anything. You just need to use something to make it apply more pressure. Basically, you're trying to thicken up that pad. That's really all you're doing, and you'll see that. Uh, I just use the scissors to cut it. You can actually see I've been cutting a couple already. Um, and just a Phillips screwdriver, as these ones don't have any like security bolts or whatever, the torque security screws. So if you're wondering, I use the 2.5 size on it uh, to get in these. You might be able to use a different size. This one I just feel works pretty well for me. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really not a bad repair at all. And it's like I said, it's super cheap. I mean, you could really just do it with like some paper or something if you wanted to. It doesn't have to be what I'm using. There we go. I don't know why that one wanted to hang in there so much. But let's see, we've got two more to go. Come on out. Right. Oh, wow. It was actually on the end of my uh, screwdriver there. Let's see. But yeah, I mean, the good thing about these controllers is that you really, well, at least me personally, I've never really had any other issues with them outside of that. Now, I've had issues with I open it up and somebody like spilled something all in the controller. And it just messes up the board and I wasn't able to fix it. I've had that issue happen. But other than that, you know, this is usually the most common issue I guess people get rid of the controllers for. Uh, and funny enough, it's a super simple fix. So usually with the open knees, once you get the screws off, you can already just start breaking it apart. Uh, what I do is I push these in on the back and then I just try to lift it up over because I try to keep these analog sticks I mean, not analog sticks, the uh, the trigger sticks. Oh, that one actually came off with it. So if it does come off with it, just make sure that you don't lose this little spring right there. Because that's what's giving you your, basically your your spring, I, <laughs> your your pushback. So if you lose that, um, yeah, your, your controller is not going to function correctly. So just make sure you don't lose that. This one is quite dirty. Um, we're not going to focus on actually cleaning it on this video because, like I said, this one is just more of a fix. But we'll go ahead and pop our battery out. I guess the only other issue I've ever come across is the battery won't hold charge anymore. So sometimes you'll have to replace the battery. But other than that, that's that's usually about it. They're usually pretty bulletproof. Um, there's one screw right here that you have to take off to 
basically remove the board and then you are at the little ribbon cable I was telling you about. It may not be called a ribbon cable, that's just what I call it. So move this board back here. And sometimes if it feels like it's giving you some trouble, you just gotta make sure that these aren't catching. So you can pull that out. Really, you don't have to do like much more than this if you don't wanna pull the whole thing apart. Just kind of move the analog sticks down and you can usually get it out. Let's see, there it is. Okay, so basically there, and this is what you're looking for. So basically this ribbon cable right here that's coming from the front, that is what's making connection with that right there. And that is, you know, basically what's sending all the inputs to the board from the buttons. So you just basically take this little plastic sheath off of it. And once you do that, it's a little harder with these gloves but this controller was disgusting so i really wasn't looking forward to touching it so once we take that off you can see that uh oh the pad fell down i was about to say there actually is no pad but there was so this is the pad it's just a little black piece of foam it's nothing special and it basically sits in this plastic piece right here and it just basically sits there that's literally all it does and it just makes sure that this stays pressed against that and you get you know, a good connection. So what I do is basically just sit it back in its place. We'll sit that down here. And then I come over here and I'll cut off a little section of this. The good thing about this is that it's actually already adhesive. So I can pretty much just lay it right on top of it and don't have to worry too much about it. it doesn't have to be a perfect cut or anything like that. Cause like I said, you're really just trying to thicken it up. That's all you're doing. And we'll take this off, get it off, off of my fingers. We will lay this down right over top of it. Make sure, oh, come here. Just lay it down, all right. It's over it. Stay and stop sticking to my finger. All right, all right. So we got that. Then you just want to, it's like two little holes in this like cable thing or ribbon, whatever you want to call it. Basically, just make sure that goes back over these little plastic hooks. That holds it down. You can press it down some if you want. Then we flip it back over. You stick your analog sticks back through. Make sure that it doesn't move. And you line it back up. You'll see it's like two little plastic um, pieces that slide through the board. And once you do that, let's see here. Come on. Did we get you through? Oh, see that one. It's trying to be a butt. Get through there. All right. Okay. So did we get that to sit? Yep. Okay. That's set right. Everything's good. Once you get that, now you want to grab your screw to tighten your board back down. Now, when you put the screw back in, it may feel like a little bit more, like you might have a little bit more resistance than when you normally would do it because you're putting additional, you're trying to push down that new phone. That's pretty much, you know, why it might feel like it's a little more tight than normal. Uh, so now basically we have to stick this back on and oh, both of them ended up falling off. Okay. The other one's there. So if that does happen to you, basically what you want to do is you want to make sure the spring itself is pushed up against the top like that. So basically you want it hanging down. The other part of the spring is up against it. And then you just slide it literally right back on it. So it'll be that way. And then you just slide them right in. Like bang. See? So it just clicks right in there. You'll have your spring. You'll see it laying right there. The other part is laying up in here. And you get your, <laughs> you get your spring back, I guess. I don't have any technical terms for it. But it's super easy. You just have to make sure you don't lose the spring. Because if you lose the spring, you pretty much ruin that controller until you either A, find the spring, or you can just get you a donor spring from like a very bad controller that you have. All right, so we got that, and that one's in. Now we will grab our battery, throw that in there like so. And do we get it? Yep, okay, that's down, plug it back in. So you can't flip you around. Come on, buddy. Get on up in there. 
feel like Billy Madison. Why don't you want to go in your hole? You don't like your home? <laughs> that movie was a trip. There we go. All right. So now we got our battery back in. What you want to do is try to lean it down over that so you get there so you don't crack those back off. You can do a little jiggling. Usually it takes a little bit and she'll just like kind of sit down in there. Come on. Don't. Oh, it picked it back off. This is the worst part about putting the controller back together because sometimes that can happen and it just basically it's just annoying. Like it's not really anything else to it other than it's just annoying. And you might have to do this a couple of times. I remember when I first started taking these apart, this was like the worst part for me. I used to hate having to clean these with a passion just because of this one freaking time. I mean, one freaking spot. Like it's always a headache for me. All right, come on, sit on in there for me. All right, there we go. Come on. All right, you're almost there. Just kind of keep, keep working. There we go. She's slowly falling into place. There we go, got one over there. Did I, oh, I think this one came off. Did it come off? I hope not, but it's looking like it did. Why is this one not going on? Come on, buddy. There it is. Okay. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get them to click, uh, but this one did. See, that's what I mean. If it comes off, it won't have any springs. So we're going to have to pop it back off. Uh, we'll have to just keep working it until we get it to sit right. Like I said, sometimes that happens. And you're getting to see real time how that can be frustrating. It's a really simple thing. It's just can be a super headache. Especially if you're trying to knock it out really quick. Like in this case where I'm trying to show something completely different. Of course, you know, the buttons want their time to shine. All right. So we'll try that one more time so we can get it to slide on there this time. There we go. All right. And no, you son of a bitch. Okay, there we go. All right. Maybe because it wasn't fully closed, but we got our spring back now. You know, it doesn't feel super springy. But we'll deal with that in a little bit because I'm just pretty much going to show you that that one would have to be tweaked. But I'm just going to show you that it doesn't spaz out anymore because I'm not going to sit here and keep fooling with that because, like I said, that can become a super headache. Again, you might be putting a little, you're probably putting a little bit more pressure on the board than normal. So when you're screwing these in, it might feel like, I don't know, it might feel a little bit more resistance than normal. That's, that's actually completely normal for this fix. So don't feel like you're doing anything wrong. And the thickness of that is really not going to be, you know, something that bends or warps the board. You know, we're pretty much just given that, uh, original piece of foam, just a little bit of help. That's all this really is. And what's funny is you can, you kind of know that Sony realized that this, you know, probably wasn't the best from a designs perspective because on the PS4 controller or the DualShock 4, and I believe also the DualShock 5, they actually changed that into a locking ribbon cable to where it would just sit in the slot and you just put your little lock over it. So apparently they were aware that over time you would get this issue. Uh, but we got it all together. We'll plug it back in. Let's see if we fixed it. All right. You can see we're wiggling the top. We're not getting anything. We're shaking the controller. We're not getting anything. We're wiggling again. Nothing. So, but once you start moving, everything works as it should. Your analogs work. If you ever want to check your buttons, you pretty much can go to like any folder. Usually, uh, Surprise it's not showing up. I guess because I tried to say you could do this and it's like, oh, really? But normally it'll give you like a square option. But you just hit X. There it is. See, if you hit square, options down there pops up. So you can just test it like, oh, square works. Obviously, triangle for options. Circle to go back. And I don't believe the top buttons do anything in the uh, in the little overview. Or I forgot what it's called, like the XMB or something like that. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, you can test your middle button if you want, because it'll pop up there with the controller. Uh, 
the battery in this one actually is either not reading at all or it's bad because you get that there. So we would have to replace the battery in this one. Uh, but again, so what? The whole point of this video was to just show you like how quick you could fix that issue if you're having that issue on your controller. Uh, super cheap, like I said, it can be paper, it can be anything. You just need to stick, uh, really just need to thicken it back up. Uh, that's that's pretty much the only way to word that one. All right, so if that was all you needed, then you can go ahead and leave the video now. Uh, and now I'll tell you about why I didn't do WFS on Walmart. All right, so if you stuck around and you wanna know why this video wasn't about WFS, uh, it's because two things. The first and foremost is WFS is, like I said earlier, a complete headache. Like every item you want to do WFS for, you almost have to set it up for the service itself. And that sounds like it's a normal thing, but it's really not. Because when you do Amazon FBA, any listing you're selling against, you can literally just say, I want to do FBA. And you can just send the stuff to Amazon. They'll give you the little labels to print out, put on your products. And when you send it there, you know, it goes into your inventory and then they begin selling it and shipping it for you. Whereas with WFS... Walmart actually makes you, even if you're already selling against that listing, when you convert it to a WFS, it makes you input a ton of stuff about that. It feels like you're setting up the listing all over again. So it's just like a super hassle. And then even after I went through the whole thing and submitted it, you still have to wait for like 24 hours for them to review it, to tell you if it like was approved or you did it successfully. So it's like a whole thing. I went through the whole thing. And then of course it kicked back and said it was an error. It didn't even tell me what the error was. It just said it was an error. And when I clicked it, it didn't give me, or it didn't really give me a description. So I learned while nobody does F WFSS on Walmart because you really don't need to, because no one else does it because it's such a headache and you can win the buy box, I guess, so to speak on Walmart, or you can win the main listing or be the main seller the main seller for that listing just by being the best price. So really it just is no incentive for me to do WFS right now. Uh, I do still do Amazon FBA and I usually use that for the consoles that I do sell. Um, you'll see a video about that. I know I said that before, but you'll actually see a video about uh, FBA coming up and we'll be sending off about three of the PS360 gig models, the fully backwards compatible ones. The reason why that one is still underway is because two are in the box and the third one I'm cleaning today. So it has to sit all night in order to dry. We'll reassemble it, put it together, and then we will box that up. And I'll show you me boxing it up and putting the labels on it and things like that and getting it ready to go to Amazon. So yeah, that's the whole spiel about why you didn't see a WFS video today. Um, but thanks as always for supporting the channel and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.